Now, the AMA and FDA. John D. Rockefeller had formed alliance with the Rothschilds and put his Standard Oil Trust money into the Rockefeller Foundation, which invested heavily into the petropharmaceutical drug business. Big oil and big pharma. He had to have a way to protect his investment. And something I picked up from a video on YouTube by E.C. Mullins on the Rockefeller drug empire, Rockefeller developed the American League of Municipalities to control the small towns in the United States and the American state governments to control the state governments in the United States. Then the state legislatures were used to draft new policy for controlling doctors and hospitals. And by 1904, which is on the tail end of the battle Standard Oil Trust was having with the government, the AMA created the Council on Medicinal Education, establishing standards in medical education. John D. Rockefeller's father was William Avery Rockefeller, who went by an alias, Dr. William Levingston, who identified himself as a botanic physician and sold elixirs. William was born 1810, was incited in court for a rape at gunpoint in 1849, sold his house and moved to avoid trial. This may be why he used an alias. Use of aliases is also common for secret agents. The Rothschilds have a long history of using secret agents across the globe, like John D. Rockefeller, to further their plans. In the mid-1800s, they reportedly hired someone to write a letter to the United States government to come up with two gatekeepers, so not just anyone could become a medical doctor. They came up with the AMA and FDA. After all the manipulation of legislative acts of men, the AMA and FDA are set up to protect the interests of the drug companies along with their drug dealer medical doctors. Just like the Manhattan Project, no one but those at the top knew what it was about. Most medical doctors don't have any idea they're part of some big secret combination to rule the world, but that's ultimately why the elites have been so secretive about the ultimate plan. If everyone knew why they do all the things they do is to rule the world, no one would want to participate. The elite-owned drug companies started target funding for all the medical schools right away, then used the money as leverage to have one, two, or three of the drug company directors on the medical school's board of directors to make sure their investments were spent wisely. And any medical school that didn't want to play ball like the drug companies wanted them to were put out of business. Using business malice and sometimes brute force, just like the history of Standard Oil Trust. We still have less than half the medical schools in the United States today than we did prior to the AMA and FDA getting set up, and prior to the first NGO, Rockefeller Foundation. That's a fact. Less than half. That's not democracy. That's pure business malice. If they're all about control, they must maintain a tight grip to hide the truth. So they limit the number of people at the top who really know the truth of what's going on. As soon as people learn the truth, they lose control. Hmm. What if we resurrected the schools they shut down? And remember the Benjamin Rush quote, what he said about medical freedom? That doesn't just apply to the United States. Then the Rockefellers and Rothschilds basically used the United States model as a model for the rest of the world. During the battle over the entire health industry of the planet, World War I broke out, July 28, 1914 to November 11, 1918. If not for the competing drug company in Germany, IG Farben, who didn't want to play ball with their bullies, the Rothschilds and Rockefellers, their abusers, 
that war could have never started. Rockefellers ended up with IG Farben, which is the top chemical producer in the world and top steel producer in Germany, almost exclusively used to arm Germany in World War II, 1939 to 1945. Both World War I and II were funded by the Rothschilds with heavy Rockefeller involvement. Global Times is a Chinese-based news firm that published an article about a book by Ma Quisha to change China. The Rockefeller Foundation's century-long journey in China. Published January 2013 under Guangxi Normal University Press, which states the following. The concept of traditional Chinese medicine, TCM, that stood in opposition to Western medicine developed in the late 19th century. Before that, Chinese doctors were open and flexible in their acceptance of Western treatments and ideas, but as Western techniques and theories outstripped Chinese ones and cultural conflicts developed, the idea that traditional Chinese treatments were either outdated or needed to be defended developed, culminating a division of Chinese medical practitioners into Western and Chinese medicine by the 1920s. In her book, To Change China, the Rockefeller Foundation's century-long journey in China, just published in Chinese, Ma Kuisha, Associate Professor of East Asian Studies at Oberlin College, holds that NGOs, especially the Rockefeller Foundation, contributed to this process. The basis of Western modern philanthropy had been established and the West was moving toward modern ideals of evidence-based medicine when the Rockefeller Foundation, endowed by billionaire John D. Rockefeller, entered China in early 20th century. With the spreading of the missionary movements, Rockefeller became increasingly interested in China. His foundation, bought Union Medical School and renamed it the Peking Union Medical College. The foundation not just wanted to establish a first-class school of medicine in China, it also introduced the U.S. Johns Hopkins model to the Peking Union Medical College Hospital and viewed it as a laboratory of their social ideas, which reflects the foundation's ambition to change China. Mountains of evidence on these topics have been developed over the years. Every time the elite abusers see a book like this printed, they probably just chuckle. They're probably rolling around laughing inside, knowing that people are so funny that way. They do research just to find out what's happening in their own country, their own backyard. And they don't even realize that it's actually the entire planet, the whole world that they've been doing it to. And they're probably just glad, thinking, oh, it's good. At least they didn't say what we did to the whole planet. And at least they're just focused on only one area of fraud we did, not all the other fraud, financially, legally, politically, and every other area of their lives. By the way, NGOs are non-government organizations which are not for profit usually funded by donations, as if the drug companies don't already make enough. And this way, they give people the idea they can pat themselves on the back because it's a tax write-off. But it's really another way to collect taxes, and the money is basically going into the same pockets, just more specifically to the drug companies and parasitic elite abusers. Much of what goes into health-related charities like the Race for the Cure goes to development of the next magic bullet drug, which is the modern medical version of a cure. It's a magic bullet cure theory, myth, and hoax. Insurance companies 
and hospitals. Most hospitals nowadays are run by insurance companies who give the doctors a list of things that are okay for them to do, even though the insurance company didn't go to medical school. They're not seeing what's going on with that patient right in the moment with all the infinite number of ways things can go good or bad, the choices that have to be made to get things done the right way. If the doctors try to do anything that's not on that list of protocols, the insurance companies pull their coverage, leaving them hanging for a lawsuit. So much of this comes down to who pays who. Like who pays who to write the laws. And that's how they got control over the doctors. It isn't the doctor's fault. Most of them, I respect their commitment. They spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and 10 years to go to school and still miss what we teach in the zero disease class, our prerequisite for this class where everyone comes out of the medical dark ages. Whether I'm talking about health and healing, the issues of the medical profession, the drug companies and insurance companies, and how they've been supported through the banking and legal systems and government, and even with all the persecution we've had, I've still had the same attitude. That if I can laugh about myself, <laughs> uh, because it's good healing to be able to laugh about your own issues, to bring them up, talk about it, and laugh about it. If I can do that with my own issues, maybe we can help the medical profession do that with their own issues, and maybe we can get along. <laughs> That's my approach with some of the topics within the laws of empowerment. People have long feared spilling the beans far too long. The truth is, all organizations need to be more honest and open about their issues. Spill the beans. Instead of being so secretive about it, it's time to shout it out from the housetops. As in Luke chapter 12, verse 3. Abusers prohibit anybody to talk about it and say, you better shut up or else, or don't bite the hand that feeds you type of thing. Well, I say, bite it off and say, the only hand that feeds us is the hand of God. Plus, we've got our own hands. And that's only for abusers, not for any empowered leaders or empowered teams because everything can be done right. 